Hello, 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 everybody. It's Katherine Ewing here. It is Sunday uh, afternoon, my time. Um, so good afternoon or good morning, perhaps if you're listening um, from someplace further west than I am, or uh, just happy day if you're listening, if you, if you chime in at a later time. Hey, Linda, nice to see you. So um, I hope you were a little bit intrigued by my title, Nymphs, Caterpillars, and Coronavirus. Oh, my. <laughs> um, I paraphrased, you know, lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. Because it certainly seems like, um, <clears throat> you know, a very frightening time, and we're sort of in this wilderness, um, in this place of the unknown, it can be very dark, and we're not quite sure, you know, when something might jump out and attack us. And so um, I wanted to talk today about some connections uh, that I have noticed with things in nature and um, and this coronavirus. I'm sorry, I'm going to see if I could put my do not disturb. No, I don't think I can. I'm getting notifications popping up. <laughs> on my uh, on my page here, which is a little bit, um, just a little bit uh, distracting. So anyway, let's, uh, let's start, that's a good reminder for me, to let's just start by um, shifting our energy. As we move into this space, um, <clears throat> creating, you know, even an energetic sacred space, even if we're not together in the same place, we can certainly be together in a sacred connection. So using one of my favorite tools here, my Ting Shaws, we're just gonna go ahead and shift the energy a little bit. Here we go, <clears throat> one chime for each of the chakras, allowing that vibrational frequency and the tone of the bells to just move through the energy system and um, break through any blockages of energy that may be present um, and also uh, align our energy system um, with everything that's going on. We can feel very misaligned, very scattered, very sort of off balance, um, and that can change moment to moment. Um, hey, Lucinda. And so the, the uh, Ting Shaws, the tone, the sound, the frequency is a nice way to, to sort of clear that energy and sort of bring us back into center. And um, let's just spend another moment as um, we get ready and create this space and as perhaps other people might start to join us, <clears throat> just spending a moment in prayer and gratitude. Dear Mother, Father, God, Spirit, Creator of all, we know you are present in all things, even when it is difficult for us to see you or feel you or hear, hear you or know for sure that you are here. In times like this, it's easy to fall into despair and fear and powerlessness. And so we breathe deeply now into the knowing that the energy of the consciousness that created us is always present in all things in every moment, taking a moment to connect to that truth, letting go of perhaps everything else that's been thrown at us recently as truth, 
But it's not truth with a capital T. It's truth that can change. The truth that we know to be true is that the consciousness that created us is love. And we are held in that space of love, regardless of our outer circumstances. So breathing that in and letting that energy move in and around and through us. We say thank you. Thank you for these opportunities to connect virtually. Thank you for the remembering of the truth of who we are as spiritual beings. And thank you for the healing that we know is being created in this very moment. Namaste. So on to the subject at hand. Nymphs and caterpillars and coronavirus. Oh my. <laughs> so I'm actually, um, I'm going to start with caterpillars. Hi everybody. Hi Shar, Deb. Uh, I'm going to start with caterpillars because most of us are familiar, right, with the story, hey Lois, are familiar with the story of the caterpillar turning into the butterfly. So this is a story, this is a, this whole live uh, time together here is going to be about transformation and transfiguration and something that I understand as imaginal cells and I will explain that to you as we go. Perhaps you're already familiar with that. So we know the story of the caterpillar, right? Somewhere in its natural process, the caterpillar um, feels the call to start to create a cocoon around itself or a chrysalis, right? A space within which it lives and dies for a period of time. A time of change and a time of transformation. But the caterpillar doesn't know all of that, right? The caterpillar doesn't know like, oh, I'm gonna make this cool cocoon around me and then I'm literally gonna to turn to mush <laughs> and then my cells are going to reorganize around this divine blueprint and someday I'm going to emerge out of the bottom of this thing into the highest version of myself. But that's exactly what happens. But the caterpillar just thinks it's dying. If a caterpillar thinks at all, actually, I don't know what a caterpillar thinks. But I can only imagine that as the physical body of the caterpillar is literally turning into mush or soup, um, knowing that everything has a consciousness, you know, the consciousness of that caterpillar might be questioning what the heck is going on here. But it has no choice but to be in the soup, to be in the mush, to be in the cocoon, in the chrysalis, in the sacred container, if you will, for some period of time, unknown to the caterpillar. And we know that if some curious person comes along and tries to open it up, or if maybe an animal, you know, swipes at it or something, if the cocoon or the chrysalis is opened before its time, whatever is in there is not going to be able to survive, right? But if it's undisturbed, and the cocoon and the caterpillar is able to move through its process of literally dying to its old self and then having its cells rearranged and reorganized according to a divine blueprint of its highest expression, then it emerges as a beautiful butterfly to live out the rest of its life in this beautiful higher expression of itself. And so I, I referenced before this idea of imaginal cells. So the caterpillar had within it 
the divine blueprint for the butterfly. And as it went through this period of death and rebirth, it was able to emerge from the bottom. If you ever see the cocoon, the, the, the butterfly comes out through the bottom to emerge into its new life. Right? So we, you know, most of us are familiar with that story of moving the caterpillar moving through uh, its transformation to the butterfly. So I'm going to tell you a story, um, similar story to this, but I'll give, give you a little bit of background first. So about, mm, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, I had what I called, you know, my, the summer of dragonflies. <clears throat> Every place I went, there were dragonflies. Whether all of a sudden clients were bringing me gifts of dragonfly earrings, or you can uh, see this little, it's, it's actually an essential oil um, holder. If you, if you open it up, there's a pad in there and you can put your, whoops, maybe I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, you can put the essential oil on the pad, right, inside this cute little dragonfly. I have, I don't know if you can see it, but over there hanging on my lamp, there is a dragonfly. <laughs> uh, my daughter brought me back a dragonfly from New Zealand, the beautiful necklace. Uh, someone I was dating at the time bought me this really cool hanging and it had all dragonflies hanging on it. So, you know, for years now, since I've been in this process, this sort of awakening process, when things start showing up in my life, especially by the third time, I get really curious. It's like, okay, what is going on here? And that summer, dragonflies, and I could, I, on my back porch, I would be sitting on my porch and they would be all over the place. I'd go for a walk at the reservoir, which is one of my favorite places to walk here. And I have a rock there that I like to sit on out by the water and dragonflies would be landing all over me. I mean, it was crazy. So I got curious, what's up with these dragonflies? And so, you know, one, one day um, I decided to do a little research and I looked up uh, dragonflies and the spiritual meaning of dragonflies. And um, this is what I discovered. A dragonfly starts out as a nymph. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture or an image of a nymph, but it's basically this mollusky looking thing, <laughs> you know, hard shell, you know, legs like this. <laughs> and it actually lives um, on the bottom of still water. So lakes, ponds, generally not something that's moving very fast. And the nymph lives in this cool, dark, silent, underground world for somewhere between four or five years. And then one day, it has a calling. <laughs> um, I call it a biological imperative, and it starts to move from wherever it is on the bottom of whatever lake or pond it's in, and it starts to move in its nymph-like way, and it finds a stalk. And it literally begins to move up the stalk, following the light. It's moving in the direction of the light. And then when it breaks the surface, and on its way up, it's going through some kind of transformation, but when it breaks the surface, it finds in this case, for dragonflies, a lily pad. I don't know how it figures out which stalk is the lily pad stalk, but it does. And it finds a lily pad to sit on, and it completes its process of breaking out of this ecoskeleton that it has been, this, you know, covering for four or five years. And it spreads its wings and allows some time for the sun or the wind to dry it off. And then it flies away as a dragonfly. And I thought that was the coolest story or the coolest analogy for enlightenment or awakening. 
that I had heard. And I feel like spirit brought all of those dragonflies into my awareness that summer so that I would look up and understand the story. So just think of that. When we're unconscious, when we're living life on autopilot, when we're just doing what we think we need to be doing, right? Based on how we were, how we grew up and the belief systems and the families and what we, uh, people's expectations were of us, we're just going about our life pretty much on autopilot, not being very conscious or very aware um, of ourselves, of our patterns. And then, you know, as in my case, one day I started to wake up. I'm not sure what exactly that imperative was for me, but there was what I call that divine discontent. There was something in me that started looking for something. And I started to become trained in different energy healing modalities. And you know, I don't have to go into all of that. I talked about this in the, my last live. And if you wanna go back, oh, you remember this, Mara. If you wanna go back and look at that, you can. But there was just like, like with the dragonfly or the nymph, this biological imperative, right? To start moving toward the light so that it could reach a higher expression of itself and live out the rest of its life from this higher consciousness, that's exactly what happens to all of us. Whatever stage we're in along our own journey of becoming, right, of living into, of listening to the call to become more than we are in any particular moment. So both the story of the caterpillar and the nymph are, you know, stories about elements of nature, in this case, um, you know, animals, little, little beings, dying to its old self in order to become the highest expression of itself. Now for humans, we're not, and, and notice, neither actually died, although they went through a death process, and that's what happens with human beings. When we are ready to awaken, to transform, to grow into, to become enlightened and grow into our higher potential, the imaginal cells that are already present within us, we have to go through um, I was going to just say a symbolic birth, but it's more than symbolic because when we are dying to or letting go of our ego, it can feel like you're really dying, right? Because the ego is based on individuality and doing anything it needs to do to survive, right? And it has, the mind has amazing ways of um, adapting in order to keep us alive. You know, when I when I'm when I said that, I'm thinking of you know clients, brilliant, beautiful clients who I know and have worked with, who um, whose mind adapted so much that they developed separate personalities, what we might call multiple personality disorder. These days, we call it dissociative identity disorder. But literally, the mind had to get so creative and and create these other. Uh, egos, these other aspects of their being as a way to survive whatever their life experience was. So that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing. But my point is that the mind is incredibly creative um, in adapting to new situations. So when we decide, you know, when we are awakening, when we are reaching toward enlightenment, when we feel a call to be more or do more or serve more, and that requires letting go of old patterns of behavior, old emotional imprints, old energies in the body, old belief systems. It can feel to the ego like we are actually dying. And that is the ego's greatest fear. And it is the thing really that the ego is created for is to protect us, right? To keep us alive. So it's a very... Um, it, it's quite a battle within ourselves. Um, and the other thing that I want to say about the, the, the nymphs and the caterpillars is 
they don't consciously decide one day that they're going to transform. It's really a process of divine timing, right? Where it, there is this pull to now all of a sudden move toward something else, right? And the same is true with us. I know for myself, and you know, I speak to lots of people, um, that there's a moment at which they just feel like the life that they're living um, is not working for them, is not their highest expression, feels like they're on autopilot. Whatever their own languaging is, there's something in them which moves them in a new direction to begin to explore something else. So, and in this process, not every nymph becomes a butterfly. I mean, a dragonfly. They all don't make it. Not every caterpillar becomes a butterfly. And the same, you know, use this analogy with an acorn. How many acorns do we see on the ground in the fall? In order for an acorn to live out its divine blueprint and um, become its greatest self, it's got to be smashed into the ground, into enough dirt that it can take root and begin the very long process of becoming an oak tree. It can't do that unless it's broken open and literally smashed into the dirt. And how many acorns do we see in the fall that never make it? They're on the side of the road or they're, you know, whatever. So not every nymph or caterpillar or acorn is going to reach its highest expression. Circumstances need, you know, sort of like the environment needs to be just right for that to happen. But all three of these, you know, the nymph turning into the dragonfly and the caterpillar turning into the butterfly and the acorn growing into the oak tree are all examples of chaos theory in nature. So what is chaos theory? Now, I'm not a scientist, and so I'm, you know, I'm going to give you the, the minimalist explanation of what I know about chaos theory, which is that when something reaches a certain point in its, um, in its being where there's no room for change anymore, a process begins on the inside where the molecular structure actually begins to change and then something completely new is formed. Perhaps the simplest way to think about this is if you're boiling water and you have a lid on the water. And at a certain point, the water is boiling and there's no place for it to go. And then all of a sudden it turns into steam, right? So this is, this is the simplest explanation I can give you of chaos theory, where an element has a certain amount of pressure on it. There is no place for it to go. It forces a process of sort of chaotic movement, friction, pressure, heat within it, and then something else emerges. That's what happens for the nymph, for the caterpillar, for the acorn, for the boiling water, and it's what happens for human beings. The energy never goes away, it just changes form into something else. So why am I telling you all this, right? What the heck does any of this have to do with coronavirus? Well, what if coronavirus, in the way of slowing us down, of for many of us, forcing us to be alone or even separate within our own homes or families is creating our own sacred space, our own cocoon, our own chrysalis within which we have the opportunity to do the deep change, the deep transformation the deep dive that is letting go of the ego, letting go of the beliefs, letting go of the patterns, letting go of the story, letting go of um, habitual behavior, 
and really diving more deeply into the truth of who we are as spiritual beings. Perhaps the gift of this coronavirus is that we are being given the time and the opportunity to, to take a deep dive, time we don't usually have in our very busy lives, to look at the habitual patterns that are no longer working for you, the old stories that you've been telling yourself about who you are or why you are the way you are or where you, well, that's just who I am. Well, how's that all working for you? If it's not working for you, this is the time to let it die away. And all of the expectations of self, absolutely. One of my, um, I'm not calling him old, but former, I'll say former, uh, spiritual teachers is a wonderful man by the name of Jim Self. And he used to uh, use a couple of examples that I love, and I'll share this one with you now and uh, maybe the other one with you later. But he used to talk about, or I'm sure he still does, the process that we go through once we enter into this process of awakening and enlightenment and moving out of the ego self as being in the spin cycle on the washing machine, in the washing machine, where we're spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. And everything that is not the truth of who you are that is not your essential self, is literally getting spun off. This gives me great comfort when I can't remember things. And I say, oh, that just, that just spun off. Like, it, it was unimportant. It was, you know, part of the old story. But, it's, but this is the process we're in. We are little, literally, you know how the, the, the washing machine rattles and shakes and moves around when it's in the spin cycle? We're in the spin cycle. Everything that is not essentially you is being brought to the outside, to the surface, and then spun off. So that all that is left is your essential self. One of the other things Jim used to say, and you know, you may have heard me talk about this before, about this how we're moving, and this is my belief, take what fits for you. If it doesn't fit, that's fine too. When, as I've been going through my process for the last 25 years, there were many things that I said, okay, that's interesting, but it doesn't feel like it fits for me or I don't quite understand it. And over the years, that's changed and that's shifted. So we're all, again, at different places along our journey. Some things are going to really resonate and other things are going to be like, what the bleep is she talking about, right? It's okay. Just put it over there. Maybe you'll come back to it another day. So... My belief is that we are in our process individually and collectively, like the nymph, like the caterpillar, like the acorn, going in a into a tremendous process of transformation. We are transforming from dense, physical, three-dimensional beings that are vibrate, you know, a dense, heavy energy into a fifth dimensional or higher beings where we will be vibrating higher and lighter, where our DNA, our, our uh, biology will be shifting, is shifting with all the light that's coming onto the planet over these last, you know, 30 years or so from dense carbon-based DNA into lighter crystalline-based DNA, where our strands of DNA will expand back to our original blueprint. It's been said, and I personally believe, that we were originally created as divine beings with 12 strands of DNA. And when we come into this heavy, dense energy on Earth, we're sort of dumbed down, right, to the two strands that we're told that we have. But in fact, our divine blueprint, our imaginal cells, just like 
the creatures I talked about before are actually 12-strand DNA. And as we become more awakened, more enlightened, more online, if you will, more in alignment with the truth of who we are, we begin to have access to those higher vibrating aspects of ourselves. Um, and I'll call these the clairs, and you'll some of you may know what that is, but there are clairvoyant abilities. They are our extraordinary senses, except in our highest expression, they are ordinary. And so I'm talking about clairvoyance, right? Third eye, clairvoyance, the ability to see beyond the physical. I'm talking about clairaudience, the ability to hear with spiritual ears and hear messages and, um, hey, Peter and, uh, and Corinne, we're able to hear messages, energy, channeling, intuitive hits, right, through our heightened sense of Claire audience. Claire Gustians, right, our olfactory, our ability to smell. How many times have you heard people say, you know, if they, oh, I could smell my grandmother's perfume or, you know, some other, maybe someone they loved who passed on smoked cigars and every once in a while they'll get a whiff of that cigar and they'll be like, oh, I know my Uncle Tom was in the room or I know my dad or my grandfather was in the room. I can smell a cigar. I can smell his pipe. This Claire sense, Claire Gustians is going to be increasing and improving. Claire, what haven't I said yet? Claire sentience, right? This is clear feeling where our body, where our feeling sense is more in tune. And many of us who have been on this path for a long time feel a lot of these changes. I can feel the energies of my clients. Sometimes I'll be like, why do I have all this anxiety? And then I'll sit with a client and they'll be telling me, oh my God, my anxiety is through the roof. And I'll be like, okay, <laughs> that belongs to them. And I kind of clear it up, right? So clear sentience where we can feel the energy of other people, the energy of the earth as she's going through all of these changes. And then finally, clear cognizance, right? So our cognitive mind, clear cognizance. And this is where we just know something without knowing how we know that we know. We just know. So as we're going through our own cocooning, you know, chrysalis, sacred container transformation that we're calling coronavirus, you may notice that your extraordinary senses actually are starting to be heightened. You may be dreaming more. You may be remembering your dreams, right? So anyway, if you can shift out of the fear and the worry and the numbers and the reports and again, not in a cold, uncaring way. People are suffering, and I'm not trying to do a spiritual bypass or, you know, jump over that. But energy goes where our attention goes. And so if we go into that rabbit hole, if we go into that place of worry or fear and stay there, I mean, we're all going to go in and out, right? We're all going to have our moments. But it's the choice of, oh, here I am. What can I do? How can I shift myself into a higher vibration? So what if this COVID is an opportunity for each person and the collective to die to our old selves, to our ego selves, to shed the outer appearances, right? The, the caterpillar fur, the nymph shell, right? The hard shell of the acorn. What if this is an opportunity for human beings on the planet to break free, to crack open, to open our hearts to what might be possible in this next unfolding? What if we commit to going through a period of deep and profound personal transformation during this time. 
I don't think it's coincidental at this time in our um, in humanity and of this planet that we are being brought to a grinding halt and our attention is being heightened to the fact that the systems are not working. This is the breaking down before the breaking through. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to actually share uh, something. Excuse me, I have to pull up my little Kindle here where I was listening to this 444. So of course today is 4-5-2020. Yesterday, 4-4-2020. Very powerful energy days. 2020 is a four number. So it was really a 4-4-4 four, 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 which is a high angelic number. Um, and I'm just going to read quickly something uh, for you from a, a man by the name of Steve Noble, um, who does wonderful uh, meditations and activations. Uh, and I did his 444 meditation before I got on this call. And some of us participated in the global um, meditation, you know, last night into this morning. So on this gateway, 4th April 2020, we have a conjunction of Jupiter and Pluto, planets of destruction and creation, offering us the opportunity to rise like the phoenix from the ashes of the past and start to create something new. Out of the current crisis, we can completely revision our world. And so I'm going to invite you to spend some time in these days where it's slowing down and you have more time for yourself to take the opportunity, go into quiet time, take a walk, but hold these questions in your consciousness. When we are on the other side of this pandemic, right, of this crisis, who do you want to be? Who do you want to show up as perhaps during but certainly on the other side of this crisis slash opportunity. What do you want your life to look like? What patterns or behaviors or beliefs or stories would it serve you to let go of during this time? And what do you wish for the world, for yourself, for your children, for your loved ones, for your grandchildren? What kind of world would you like to call into being during this period of time? Because it is possible. The imaginal cells of heaven on earth are here for us to dream into being, to call into being, to intend into being, to co-create together. And this time we've been given right now is such a powerful opportunity. In closing, um, I want to share with you before, uh, between doing the meditation and, and jumping on with all of you beautiful souls, I was guided to pull a card from the Goddess Oracle deck. Um, in fact, I was going to pull one from the Mother Mary deck, and then my attention was drawn here. And so I pulled a card, and I pulled the, guard, the goddess Minerva. So if you can see this, she's in front of an olive tree. Um, her breastplate is adorned with snakes, and her headdress uh, has owl feathers and actually an owl face, eyes and beak. So that's the goddess Minerva. And as always happens, it was perfect. Um, so Minerva has come to tell you that it's time to examine your beliefs and change them if they do not nurture your wholeness. How are old, outworn, unhealthy thoughts undermining your life, 
your energy, or your happiness? Do you believe what other people think and or say about you? Are you still running the tape of negative messages your parents or caregivers gave you when you were a child? Do you believe the worst about yourself or the best? Are your beliefs too rigid to permit and support your evolution? We are all born with a story. It is our choice whether we want to live the story we were born with or create one that nourishes all that we want to be. Minerva says that wholeness is nurtured when you see yourself with all of your parts, both dark and light, and choose your beliefs to serve your highest good. And there's a little poem uh, in, this, in this goddess go oracle book. Each of the um, cards comes with a little poem, and I'll close with this. And it's called Beliefs. I am what I think. My life is shaped and formed by all I tell myself. Who I am in the world is who I think I am. What I have in the world is what I think I can have. The contents of my mind are what I choose. I discard, cut out, drop that which doesn't contribute. What others believe about me is their story. It tells more about what they think than who I am. In my journey, I make sure that what I carry is of my own careful choosing and serves me well. So that's the message from the goddess Minerva. I hope that it resonates with all of you as much as it resonated with me today. And so my dear, beautiful souls, brothers and sisters, I invite you to take this time to cocoon, right? To go into your own dark space of dying to your ego self and emerging into the beautiful expression of yourself that you came here to be at this time. The earth needs you all, humanity needs you all, and I am so grateful to be connected to you all. And so with that, we will just close with a little bit of sound. You're welcome, Angela. If any of you are struggling, feel free to reach out and we can have a conversation. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here. Namaste. And I will see you all again very soon.